This week on Talking Real, we bring in special guest Fred Underwood from the National Association of Realtors to talk about diversity and inclusion. We're going to talk about why that's important for us to even discuss and some of the factors of how diversity and inclusion are important to the Realtor Association and the real estate industry broadly. So join us for the special three-part series on why diversity is so important to the Realtor Association in terms of professional development, professional standards and ethics, and advocacy. Welcome back to Talking Real, brought to you by the Oklahoma Association of Realtors. This is episode 145 of Talking Real. and Getting closer to that 150. Ooh, man, another milestone coming yeah. right up. Yeah. Nabil, how's your day today? Day is going fantastic. Good. I, I heard rumors about another freeze coming, and then I was looking at the weather, I'm like, it's in the 60s. This is fantastic. We're good. We're good so far. <laughs> Just when everybody got their power back on, we hope that now it stays on for quite some time. What a right. mess. What right. a mess. Um, so this week on Talking Real, we've got something a little bit different coming. We had a um, long conversation with Fred Underwood, who works on diversity and inclusion issues with the National Association of Realtors. And he had a lot of really fantastic information to give mm-hmm. us. It was less of an interview and more of he just kind of talked to us for quite some time. And so we've this will be the first episode of a series of episodes on uh, diversity, inclusion and why that matters to the association and why we're talking about it. Right. Because it's a big issue, right? There's, and as he, as you listen to this, he mentions there's tons of different types of diversity. So really getting into it and making strides towards making this better, it was, it was a really good conversation. Right, right. So, you know, the way this is going to work is, again, it'll be multiple parts because we we had a this is a long uh, discussion that was had. Mm -hmm. Um, And we'll throughout this, because a lot of it is is Fred talking to us and telling us all this interesting information. And and just it's just so fascinating to listen to. Um, There'll be points where Nabil and I break in and kind of have a little bit of a discussion between the two of us on whatever points Fred's making. Um, but so, so just, this will be a little bit different episode. It's going to be kind of exciting. We're really thrilled to, to have this um, and have this opportunity to present this information. I think everyone's going to find this, this series to be really, really interesting. Yes. So let's get to our conversation with Fred. Let's do it. We're joined here on Talking Real Podcast by Fred Underwood. And Fred is the Director of Engagement for Diversity and Inclusion with the National Association of Realtors. And uh, we've, very excited to have him on the podcast today. Um, we're going to be talking about diversity in the Realtor Association. But first, Fred, uh, again, welcome. How are you today? I'm great. Thank you so much for inviting me. We're, Thank you so again, much for being here. Yeah, very excited to have you. So mm-hmm. um, first of all, if you'll just give us a little bit about your role with the National Association of Realtors. Okay. You know, I've been at NAR for a number of years and, and my role is, is evolved. And today I do a lot of direct work with uh, local and state associations to talk about how we can be more inclusive of diversity, the steps that associations can take, the tools that are available to associations. I also am uh, NAR's main liaison with the National Association of Real Estate Brokers, which is a predominantly African-American organization of real estate brokers and agents, the National Association of Hispanic Real Estate Professionals, the Asian Real Estate Association of America, and several of the LGBTQ real estate organizations across the country. Excellent. Thanks for the introduction, Fred. Uh, So when we talk about diversity in the realtor organization, what all does that encompass? I know that's, that's, that's a lot, right? That's a, that's a big question. Yeah, it is. It is a big question, and um, it can it can be rather daunting if you just sort of think of it in a very abstract way. Um, we, you know, are we talking about fair housing and uh, the work we do with our customers and clients? And I think that's a lot of what we need to focus on as an association. Um, or are we talking about inclusion in our in our membership ranks, or inclusion in our in our leadership, and who's involved in the association? And is it is it uh, really focused on requirements, or are these aspirations? Are there tools and techniques that we use? So it's a very big area to consider. And what what we've done at NAR is 
Um, there's a, multiple things we're doing this year addressing uh, race and, and inclusion, diversity and inclusion, fair housing. And one of the things that's been fairly consistent about what we do and, in, and what my particular uh, area of, of specialty is, is working with state and local associations to help um, identify and develop uh, activities and programs, um, initiatives that are designed to increase the inclusion of diversity in the leadership fabric of the association. And over time, it's become very apparent that we really need to focus first on why that's important. Um, it, many of us come at this from different places. We have different uh, areas of the, of the community that we're from, different communities that we're part of, different experiences that we have. And even the question of diversity sometimes there's not unity on and we're not, we, we talk about it and we don't really have a shared understanding of what we're talking about. So it's important for us to have a conversation when we're working to address inclusion of diversity about several different things. And one is what is diversity in our communities? What, is, what do we mean by diversity? What, what, what are we talking about? You can go to one extreme and say, well, diversity is about everything that makes each of us unique. And so you can think, you can look at that and say, yes, diversity is not just about skin color or national origin or religion or uh, political belief, but it's about the fact that I like to listen to um, rock music and somebody else likes to listen to jazz. That's, that can be diversity. In our profession, it can be, um, well, I'm, I really am a, a, I love listing properties and somebody else might say, I really like working with buyers, that's diversity. So we wanna define what, what do we mean by diversity before we start down a discussion in this area. I think the first area that comes to mind most of the time in the real estate world is racial and ethnic diversity. And that's partly because that's how our society seems to be most divided at this time. And when we think about the issues that, that confront our society and many of our communities, racial divisions are very real. And those divisions have some of their roots in the way that real estate uh, activities were, were done in the past, even up to the current time because of racial restrictions on where people could live, because of redlining, because of overt discrimination or even other type, types of discrimination that maybe is less conscious. And our, our profession and our association were part of setting up the housing system that resulted in largely segregated communities across the country. So we have a responsibility in a way to take a look at what, what our society is in terms of racial inclusion and say, well, what can we do as an association to be more inclusive? And that's, that's, a, that's, that's a, 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 a rationale as to why race and uh, ethnicity is the focus of a lot of our diversity efforts. But if we look a little bit Further than that, there are related areas that are equally troublesome for many people. And we, you know, at the same time, NAR allowed boards to exclude people on the basis of race. They also allowed boards to exclude people on the basis of gender. So women were not always allowed to be realtors in all parts of the country. And yet when we look at our associations today, except at the highest levels of the corporate real estate side. And maybe at the highest levels of NAR leadership, there's still a tendency that um, in those areas where it's more male dominated. But if you look at who's in the leadership and who's the active leaders of our association at the local level, at the state level, and on almost all of the national committees and, and functions, women and men are equally involved in, in leadership. So that's a great example of where we have been inclusive of an area where there was exclusion in the past. 
the work is not done, but it's much further along than on the questions of race and ethnicity. So when we look at race and ethnicity, we want to look at our own communities and we want to understand what that diversity is. So wanted to break in here and just point out a thought that I thought was really kind of profound. You know, he mentioned when like, why are we talking about diversity and more specifically why so much of our discussion focuses around racial and ethnic disparity? And I think it's a, a hard fact to some degree that those of us that are in the real estate industry, in particular, the Realtor Association have to look at is that our association was part of creating this housing system that had racial and ethnic disparities sort of built into it and baked mm-hmm. into it originally. And so to that degree, when we were maybe part of creating that problem, we have a duty to talk about it and to look at where are there still areas where that's going on and, you know, pieces of the housing system that that do have that disparity still going on. And how are we taking a part in fixing it when maybe we weren't on the right side of it originally? Right. And I think we've taken steps beyond what needed to be done right now, but you're right. There's still work to be done. Absolutely. You know, he pointed out that we've made great strides in, um, you know, where women were traditionally excluded and have, have done a much better job of changing gears on that. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, that's one area that, um, again, we've improved upon and, you know, here at the, the local level here at the, the state association, you know, we're looking at the creation of a diversity and inclusion committee to start having these discussions as well, because it is important for us, not just at the national level, but here in our own communities to start talking about as well. And so I think we're going to get back to it and talk more about what things look like here in Oklahoma. Right. Because I think diversity really starts at the ground level. Absolutely. Right? So let's get back to it. So in Oklahoma, the state is about 65 percent white. So we want to look at what's what's that other 35%? And it's about 10 or 11% uh, Hispanic or Latino, around 10% Native American, and then maybe about 8 or 9% African American. And numbers don't add up to 100 because people can check more than one race and they can be, um, Hispanics can be of any race. Um, but that gives you a rough idea of what your population in your state is. Looking at it a different way, This means that 400,000 Hispanics live in Oklahoma. That's a huge population. Um, So you can look at it either from percentage or from actual numbers. And if you really drill down, according to the Census Bureau, you have over 100,000 Asian Americans who live in in Oklahoma. So now we want to know, well, why does that matter to us as an association? Um, So I will walk through a couple of ways to look at this and hopefully as you go back to your local associations or you have your conversations at your state meeting or even in your in your offices um, to think about why it's important to be inclusive of diversity Um, so let's let's just take any community for example and let's let's say there is a magical community in oklahoma that roughly reflects the statewide population. And in that community, you look around and you say, wow, 10, 12% of our population is Hispanic, another 10% is Native American, another 8% is is African American. Well, first question I would ask is, what real estate do they use? You cannot be in a community without using real estate. And it is, it's something that's very unique for us. If we were, if we were the, uh, the accountants association, accountants don't, I mean, you don't occupy a number. You don't occupy a dollar. You use numbers and dollars. But real estate is something we live in, we work in, we occupy, and we use. And so when your community is 10% Hispanic or 15% Hispanic, That means that 10% or 15% of the people using real estate in your community are Hispanic. So you want to find out who's serving that population, who's working with your Latino population, who's working with your black population, who's working with your Asian American, your Native American populations, and then have a question, are they at the table with us? And 
you might ask, well, why is it important that they're at the table? And um, I, I, I think you can go through some, some various analyses to look at that. But first and foremost, you want to find out, are they at the table? In sufficient numbers that you don't have just one token voice for a community, but that you, you really have that voice reflected. And put another way, um, a realtor once contacted me um, because she was frustrated that she'd made multiple attempts to run for her board. And she said, I just want to make sure there's somebody that looks like me when decisions are being made about the real estate that affects me for the person that she is. So you think about that. You, you have a member in your association and they look at who's making decisions about real estate and they don't see themselves reflected in who's making those decisions. They're much less likely to find value in membership and they're much less likely to participate in the association. And um, so we now have this kind of chicken and egg thing. Well, we need more inclusion of diversity, but the lack of inclusion discourages. So I, we'll get to methodologies and perhaps in another podcast, but today I want to go through some of the whys. Um, and I, I want um, everyone to understand that these questions, these analyses rely on some basic data that you need to gather. And th that basic data is you need to know the demographics of your board service market area or your market area. And you can get that from your county, from your city, from Wikipedia, from the state. You know, it's, it's out there. Now, we're counting again. We're having the middle of another census. But even our cities and our states often, and the federal government often update numbers in between censuses. So you can get a good idea of the demographics of your market area through that. You also, because everyone occupies real estate and uses real estate, you collectively have knowledge of which communities are growing and shrinking. Um, and th that's an important piece of information as well, um, because that shows you where activity might be. Um, and then the second number that's important is the demographics of your membership. And this is a tough number to get, but NAR is developing a tool and it should be available this year where your local association will be able to get a fairly good estimate of its membership demographics. And that way you can, you can take your temperature. It's like, it's like when you, you're feeling bad and the doctor says, do you have a fever? Why? Because that helps the doctor understand what, what may be wrong and what's necessary to, to address it. So you want to take your temperature. You want to say, well, what is our membership's diversity? And then the last number you want to look at is what is the diversity of the people who are involved in the leadership of our association? And that doesn't just mean your president and other officers or even just your board of directors. It's the people that actually are leading and are actually being the leaders, committee chairs, um, Maybe some people who aren't committee chairs, but who are always consulted when major decisions are being made. But if you really want to just have a rough picture, it would be your board of directors, your committee chairs would, would probably be a broad cross section of leadership that you could take a look at and you could say, well, does this approach? So that, that hypothetical community that exactly matches the demographic makeup of the state of Oklahoma, you might look at that board of directors and committee chairs and stuff and say, well, of all of our directors and committee chairs, it is about 10 to 12 percent um, Hispanic, another 10 percent Native American, another 8 or 9 percent African American. You know, is, is that 30 percent, 35 percent of our leadership, does it reflect that diversity? And most of our associations will say no. So there's the two, the two levels. You have your population diversity and your leadership diversity. And you wanna say, okay, does that leadership reflect that population? Obviously you can't get there without the membership also reflecting the population, but you can move in the right direction. Those numbers are important. So I think you know, early in this section, he talks about who is serving the various commu constituent communities. You know, he talked about the uh, kind of the, the racial and ethnic background of Oklahoma. Mm -hmm. 
and finding out who is serving that community. And then are they at the table when it comes to things like the advocacy that we're doing and the leadership decisions that we're making? And I think that's a something that obviously we don't know, which is a good thing while we're talking about creating this diversity committee, because we don't we don't know. And I feel like this makes me think of our conversation with Kathy Perez Whiteside. That's exactly what I was thinking. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, we had a great conversation there, and I think it really boiled down to this of who is in the community and Mm -hmm. are they being served, who's serving that community, and then are they at the table? And I think this is some of that unanswered question that we have here. Right. And other than being uh, diverse and inclusive, which which are all great things, this also provides a good business opportunity for people, right? You do your research into what your population is in the metro area, the area that you're serving, and then you can kind of see what are the needs. And then you can kind of cater to those needs so to, you know, really grow your business as well and really take care of that that need that people have. Right. So it's not even just, you know, diversity for diversity's sake, but you know, there's there's good reasons to do this from mm-hmm. a business standpoint and just serving that community, right? We want everybody to have the opportunity to uh, you know, be homeowners, to be real estate investors, to be a part of this thing that we do. We want it to be a full and complete market. And so making sure that we are catering to every community that's out there is really important. But that also means that the makeup of our association has to mirror what those communities look like so that we know where they are, who they are, and that we're getting those people to the table from a leadership standpoint so that they're influencing the direction that we're going in. All like really important things that, like you said, they're hard questions and they're hard things to do, but getting that ball rolling to start making sure that we are doing a good job is really important. Right, and I think there were a couple other really good points he made in that little section. One was what we do affects everyone at a very deep and intrinsic level, right? Home, you live there, security, real estate. That's It's not like other professions. And then two, there is a difference, which I think why he emphasized of people being at the table. Uh, There is a difference of putting, putting yourself in someone else's shoes and looking at it from their perspective versus actually seeing what they need. Right, versus them telling you, this is actually my perspective rather than trying to imagine that the other way, right? So, one, it's easier because you don't have to go through that. Right, right. <laughs> and you actually get to hear from people. But, yeah, I think that's that's important to have them actually involved. Yeah, for sure. All right, let's get back to it. Back to Fred. So now, why does that matter? So I want I want everyone to sort of stop and think why do I belong to and participate in my association? What is it? What is the purpose of the association? What does it do that draws my time, my energy, my, my intelligence, my knowledge, my creativity? You know, why, why does it pull me in? What, what is it about the association that's important for me? And we can get some guidance by looking at the purpose of the association, which has been labored over many times by all of our local boards and our state association. So we're not here to recreate the purpose. So we look at that purpose. And the Oklahoma Realtor purpose has three components in it. You want to be provide comprehensive professional resources for realtors to be professionals. You want to hold members to the highest ethical standards, and you want to be a unified voice for real estate. So I'm going to take each of those three areas, and I'm going to talk a little bit today about why inclusion of diversity is important to achieving that goal. And maybe that will help you build a strong case for inclusion at your local association and at the state association, and most importantly, your understanding of why inclusion is important. So I want to start with professional development. And I'm going to tell a story about another board, and then we'll come back and talk about how that might be relevant here. Some of you may have heard of a a gangster back in the 30s named Al Capone. Al Capone lived in Cicero, Illinois, and Cicero and its neighboring community, Berwyn, were heavily Italian and Eastern European, and stayed that way into the 70s or 80s. 
there was one association that served those two communities and a little bit of the surrounding area, but not much, a very small association whose leadership reflected the community at the time. It was, was Eastern European and, and Italian, but the community changed and the community became largely Hispanic and in particular, largely Mexican. So the board looked around and they saw, we have a mismatch between our community, which is Hispanic and our board, which is Eastern and Southern European. We need to do something here. And they were frustrated because they would try different programs and different activities and no one would attend them, would come. And in the conversation that we had, um, I was, I was saying, well, if you've tried everything and no one's there, maybe there isn't anyone who's in real estate, which I knew wasn't the case, but I, you have to sometimes just throw that question out when you're talking about this. And they said, oh, no, no, just every Tuesday, the bank has a seminar on how to, how to use their products, and it's full of the Latino realtors that are serving the community. Well, that, in an essence, is a description of why you need that inclusion in your association. If they had included Latino realtors in the discussion about what education offerings they could have at the association, or if they had even taken the step to go to one of those sessions and talk to some of the members that were there, they would have found out what that training need was. What what did the community of real estate community serving the Latino population need to do their job? And they're willing, just like all of us are willing to go to a class when we can see that it's gonna help us do a better job at being a realtor, be more successful at being a realtor. Clearly there was a need, but the association didn't know the need. But if they had reached out and included Latino realtors in their discussions about the education offerings that they would provide, instead of trying to do a culturally relevant session or trying to, you know, um, make some specific outreach that met with a thud, they would have had an education program that would have really brought people in. And they might also have un understood that even though everyone does business in English, when you're learning something new, sometimes it's helpful to have it be taught in the language that you're most comfortable speaking. And that was, that's another association did that very effectively. Um, they were having trouble attracting their members of different ethnic groups. And they did have a few people in leadership and they listened to a couple of the people in leadership who said, you know what, we need to have our next session on the new lockbox and the new contract. We need to have it in Spanish and Vietnamese and other languages. And suddenly two, 300 people showed up to learn about these, these documents because why would they hire somebody else to teach them when it's already a part of their, their benefits as being a, a realtor? So when you think about inclusion of diversity, it helps you understand the education needs of the people serving your entire market. It also helps you understand where your existing education may not be adequate. And this comes into play around lots of issues and in particular around fair housing um, questions. If you don't have realtors who represent all different parts of the com community, how are you going to know if the practices of your members are missing the boat when in terms of marketing to a particular part of the community? Put another way, if, if your community includes um, areas where English is not widely spoken and where there are stark cultural differences in the way that people do business, are you doing the best service for your members if you don't have educational offerings that help people understand the needs of those communities? Um, and I would argue that that's not helping the, the whole real estate community provide the best services. Because as we know, any realtor can serve any customer and client. There's no restrictions on, or there should be no restrictions based on race or ethnicity of who our customers and clients are. So we wanna make sure that every realtor has the tools to reach every part of the market as, and compete fully in that marketplace. And just like we wanna know, well, what, what are the realtors who are already serving that community? What do they need in terms of professional development? They also can help us understand 
you know, every time I work with a realtor from the, the, the rest of the board, they don't understand that um, the customers and clients here need X, Y, and Z to be able to qualify. So it could be, it could be from just a, an availability of a different type of mortgage, different type of mortgage product that might not be needed in other parts of the community, or it could be um, challenges in closings. Um, uh, maybe maybe all the closings are being done somewhere where it's hard for people in that part of the community to get to. We don't know the answers at the national level. You do locally. So that's the conversation that you have. And I think if you start to bring in all different parts of the community and design your professional development around them, you are directly providing value to um, more of your members in areas that are most relevant to what they need today. And you're also able to understand and communicate back. And maybe they're not aware of some of the, the tools and programs that we have as an association. And it could, it doesn't have to be related to ethnicity or race. I mean, you know, maybe they're not aware that we have a realtor safety program. Maybe they're not aware that we have right tools right now to help members take advantage of products and services and training. Maybe they're not even aware of your state convention. And so they don't even, they don't even try to come. And so this helps you market your association and everything you offer of member value back to your members. But primarily because professional development or education um, is such a key part of what we do, this can very, be very helpful there. And that's closely related to ethics or professional standards. I love the many ways that he connects diversity and inclusion to education and professional development. And, mm -hmm. you know, he talked about how there was an association and they tried to create a, and I'm kind of like air quoting here, culturally <laughs> relevant um, education session for people of a particular, you know, ethnic community. And it was kind of a flop. And, and why was that? And I was like, well, they, they hadn't reached out to, uh, you know, the people in that community to find out what they needed. And so, you know, they, they realized there was a need, but had they reached out and included those people to say, what is it that you, you need, as opposed to them going to the bank where a hundred people turned out for a session that was helpful. You know, the association could have created that education. So in, in an effort to create member value and to serve all the members, what are you doing to all these various communities in terms of bringing them in, giving them the seat at the table that we talked about earlier and, and making sure that the association is then creating member benefits and member values for them, not only so that the people that do serve that community um, as realtors have the education they need to do their job the best, but also so that other people who um, may not quite as often serve that community have the tools necessary so that when they do have a client that is in that community um, that they can better serve them as well. And so it's sort of that multifaceted approach of, of the people that are there all the time and then the people who aren't there all the time also need that education, but getting it from the people who are directly there day in and day out to say, this is what we need, I think is a really important point. Yeah. I think this, this goes back to, putting yourself like in their shoes and thinking about what they need rather than just getting it straight from them and being, having them evolve. So that was like a, that was a great point there. And then, yeah, it enhances member value for sure, as we saw with that example, but then the fair housing point was really interesting, right? It's your ability to serve that population or that segment of the market or even your members uh, to that point better and well. And because the members will get that education like you were talking about. But it was a, the fair housing tie in to the whole diversity education was a really good point. Absolutely. It's it's hard to talk about fair housing and to say this is what we need to be doing if we don't necessarily know where we're going wrong. Right. You know, what are what are we doing right? What are we doing wrong? And if we don't have people from that community involved you know, they're going to have those direct examples of this is, you know, areas where we can do better. And so we can tailor that education and again, make sure that, yeah, we don't, like he said, we don't know where we're missing the boat. And so until we figure that out, we don't know how we can offer better professional development to tie up the loose ends as opposed to maybe just doing the same thing we've always been doing, 
you know, let's find the areas where we're missing out and, and try to fix those. Yeah. So next we're going to be talking about how diversity is an important component of ethics and professionalism. But we're going to talk about that next time on the next session in this series with Fred Underwood to talk about diversity, inclusion and the Realtor Association. Uh, but we're going to wrap this episode up right here and we've got much more. We're probably going to have two more episodes to talk about this subject because it is so deep and so important just to start understanding even why we're talking about it from the, the, the beginning of it, how it relates to, as he mentions, professional development and education, how it relates to ethics and professional standards, and then finally, how it relates to advocacy. Mm-hmm. And so we're going to cover all those topics on future episodes of Talking Real. That's right. So if you haven't done so yet, hit that subscribe button so you know when the next episode in this series and other episodes are released. And share this podcast with a fellow realtor. I switched that up instead of saying real estate enthusiast. So keep you on your toes. Absolutely. <laughs> and don't forget, if you've got feedback, we want to hear it. We want to hear what you guys are thinking out there. So hit us up. Send us an email to podcast at okrealtors.com. And until next time, we'll see you next Tuesday on Talking Real. Talking Real.